the five common mistakes that beginners make. The painting is very important, but I think the building and cleaning is on par. I'll tell you now, I never once put an extra purity seal on a model. <laughs> Not <laughs> once. It stands out as a mistake for me it's because it was something that I just never even addressed as a mistake. It will it will seriously give you problems down the line if you don't if you don't do it right from day one. I was so obsessed with blending as smooth as possible that I would kill all of the contrast on my models. When you hear different people's painting situations and then you see how good they are at painting, it will make you realise, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs>
gives every, someone who potentially just paints X game system the opportunity to go, well, I have something for me now. It's just giving that diversity of game system in the competition. Um, so do you think, for example, I mean, it's all guesswork, isn't it? But do you think someone, who's, someone who, enters, who wants to enter a single model that's from Underworlds, for example, surely that will get pushed into AOS single potentially, figure, but they don't, rather it, than it, being in the Underworlds category, which seems more like if you're, if you're giving bands. a whole category to a game that has small squads, yeah, surely the... But but it, that's uh, the thing, though, because you've got some of these game systems are broader than others, right? So Necromunda having its own category, the Necromunda range is much more compressed in what's within it. But if you look at like Horus Heresy, that's anything from a full-size Titan to a Mark IV Marine. Yeah, Whereas if you look at Necromunda, it's mostly war bands of a similar size, right? I think... I think uh, because obviously, again, at the time of recording this, I haven't seen the new rules for the, for, for it. But I think once the rules are released and the clarifications are released, I think it will qualm a lot of people's reservations if they've got any. Um, yeah, I think that you thing is, is if you don't diversify and try new things, it's, it will stagnate over time, I think. I still think, I think, it, I think it's cool on the whole. Like, There's so many categories now as well. It gives you so many more good. opportunities yeah. to, to enter. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I, I think they, because at, the, at first... The the I think there's like a thousand entries. I don't know what exactly the number was, but I think it's like it's the I know it was the most entries I've ever seen at Golden. We've Demon. all guessed roughly a thousand, yeah, right? Like it, it's, the... it was like the most entries I've ever seen, and I think that shows how far the interest in GD and the amount of people that are improving as a painter to to want to enter or pushing themselves to enter competitions. That shows how much it's grown over the last you know three years, even with lockdown and pandemic and stuff. So I think the re rejigging of categories and also opening up of different things has kind of always kind of been on the horizon, I think, with the way that things have happened. Um, if single figures are allowed in some of these broken down categories, I'm intrigued to see if 40k single fig remains the the toughest well, comp. I, I think it will because when you look at it, those, so 40k single fig, historically, I... I'm not some big like GD buff or anything, but I wouldn't assume that a lot of say like Necromunda models. I, I wouldn't say Necromunda made up a lot of percentage of entries. real estate in the single fig 40k. But do you think that's universe. because it didn't have its own category before? Well, no, no. I'm saying like because I, I don't think I would have seen loads. So I don't think and, and Necromunda is is that the only one that's yeah, 40k yeah. based that's separated. Well, looking out. at last year's categories. I think like all the smaller game systems like Necromunda and that basically went into the 40k category. That's what I'm saying. So and I don't I don't think that that made up a huge percentage of the single fig 40k. But do you category. think that's because so, they didn't think they could get a look in because that model compared to a 40k model wouldn't compete as well. I Therefore, don't know. You I didn't don't know. see much Necromunda. I don't know. I think it's probably just because if you're going to paint a single figure from 40k you're going to pick a 40k model. Yeah, I I I'm more I don't, not that it doesn't happen and there's some really cool models in those other game systems. The one that it benefits most from I think is I've always banged on about how the Underworlds models are so cool. Yeah, yeah, they are good. Um, yeah. So if you can do a single, I, I think you'd find more people wanting to enter a single Underworlds model into AOS single figure. I, I, and I don't know whether they're going to be allowed to do that now. I don't I no think it, I don't think it will be. I think Underworlds will be the the, the full warband. I think that, that that in my mind that's why I would read it purely because. Uh, if you if they if they are going down the line of by game system, if you think of it that way, for me that would mean that um, for specifically for that category that you would have to paint the warband, which does make. But the only thing that's missing then, if I look at that, is Horus Heresy has its own cat, whereas it used to be Horus Heresy squad was in forty k squad. Yeah. So that would mean in terms of warbands, you could have one from every single game system as a squad in its own category, other than Horus Heresy. So essentially, there's like six squad cats, basically. Yeah, but I'm yeah. saying the interesting thing is that would be but bar, Horus Heresy, bar Horus Heresy, right? But that, look, they do, they obviously do it by interest in the game system. Like that's why Middle Earth is all in its on its own as well. Like that's not. There's not Middle Earth. Do you know, that's, that's a really good point. What was it last? Sorry, what was it last year for Middle Earth? Last year was just the the same scenario of Middle Earth. Just had it was own. just a Middle Earth. Yeah. So this is the thing. So like I can't. I'm trying to scratch my brain here and remember, but the last couple of times I've looked in the Middle Earth 
category at, at Fest and also at the GD that was at Warhammer World. Um, and thinking right back to other, uh, even ones that were uh, in Coventry back, um, before pandemic and stuff. Um, I don't remember whether there were four units or if it was just single figures. In I, I think, in, I think in Lord of the Rings it was just single figures, but I think that wasn't a stipulation of the category. I think that was just what people did. I think that's the case. Yeah. So that could point to all, it, previous Middle Earth categories. Then rules wise, could point towards what they're going to do for Underworlds category, Necromunda category, um, Blood Bowl category. It's interesting though because I obviously someone's going to turn up with a, a jewel based in, on Blood Bowl or something. That's obviously going to get put in the jewel diorama. I would category. guess so. Well, yeah. that's that's yeah. the uh, the elephant in the room. Well, this is jewel and diorama are now one category. Well, yeah, so that's, yeah. let's talk about that then. The, the, <laughs> I, I know, like for example, like Mark Lifton, one someone I know, like he 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 he's like prolific at jewels. That's like I think his thing. He loves a good jewel, and um, um, and he's won loads, obviously, for how skilled and talented he is. But but the thing is, is like the jewel obviously is quite focused, um, and obviously that's the one that I won my one with in twenty eighteen. Like it, it's just two two models obviously facing off, whereas obviously a diorama is that is that, but but magnified, but it doesn't really hang on the interaction as much i would say it's more about the scene so from a judging perspective you're then going to be judging against the composition of the piece how the models will interact with each other and the overall look of it and then you're going to be judging almost that but really granular between two models i don't think from a judging perspective i don't i know a lot of people love jewel and love diorama separately as their things but i think from a judging perspective there's not really too much difference in the way that you would look at those two things in my mind, because there's still arguably a scene with models involved engaging each other or doing something. You might have a couple of guardsmen standing by a tank, in, like not doing anything. Does depend a... on the model though, because interestingly, the one they've used for the cover is the Bard's Revenge model, yeah. and that's basically that is basically a jewel. You yeah. think no, of it no. as a single fig, right? But it's a no, jewel. no, no. But I'm saying even as a jewel, that, that I don't think of as a diorama. No, like no. some no. jewels you could argue are like diorama-esque they're on a big base I think well, this, that's is, the, this is the thing I think that's, that's part of it is that over the years last few years um, the lines have been blurred a little bit between I think in every categories. category everything's getting more and more diorama even like single fig even squad now everything's on like one big scenic base I'm guilty of that obviously but 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 yeah I guess so. I mean look I, like, but then you, you say that but then one of the most prolific winner Angelo Ducello is, is classic gaming base on a plinth you know, like, and he's got more. more... I don't think uh, we're not necessarily saying, oh, you need to do that to win. No, no, but no. But what I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, in terms way. of entries, that seems to be the trend. You're seeing more and more and more in terms of percentage of entries. Things are leaning. Yeah, up. you are. I'm not yeah. saying you have to do that to win. No, you no, obviously don't. No, but there's that, that's the same thing with like saying, oh, you have to do NMM to win. You know what I mean? Like, it's like that. It's it's you know, like it's all about how well the model's painted, plus all the other factors that they look at. You know, the quality of the build. You know, all those kind of things. Like the. the all the things that they look for, I don't think there's like a linear path. Like they even say it, like it's not even about heavy metal style. Like a lot of people used to think that it's just, oh, you've got to paint heavy metal style. I agree with know, all those factors. I'm know. just saying, if you look at the plethora of entries that you see, you do notice trends and people are. Yeah, oh, yeah we're talking more about that, like, just the fact that things are. That's what's popular. Things are blurring I, no, I towards being a diorama in every category. And the most of that was definitely dual. Like there was somewhere. You had to like think a minute to tell what the jewel actually was. You know what I mean, like yeah, stuff no, like I that. Get what you mean. So and it just looked more like a diorama. But I think is, I think amalgamating is a good thing. I, I I genuinely do. As much as I know that it probably for people who really like entering jewel like as an individual category, it's going to be frustrating. But there's going to be there's going to be like individual cases in there that are going to be probably some upsets. But I'd say generally on the whole, I'm inclined to agree with you. Your your jewel that you won with, yeah. Would you, ignoring this, ignoring the, the categories being smashed together, would you look at it and think, oh, it's diorama? Well, it's still a scene. It's still, it's yeah. still like, you know, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's still, it's still an environment with models engaging each other. It, the only real difference between a jewel and maybe a diorama is the number of models that are actually on that. Obviously, a jewel has to be 1v1 typically. Yeah, like that's when you see most, that's what most jewels are. Um, so 
really, when you strip it right back to the core basics of what that thing is, it's an environment it is a diorama, with yeah. models engaging and models. It's it's still plural because there's two for a dual, but is there really that much difference between? You could argue, sorry, you could argue that it gives you more freedom on your duals that you can add a few extra things in or. Well, yeah, because it could. It could. That's a good point. Actually, it could, I didn't think it, of it in that it way. It could. Mm. It could mean that, like, you you have one one marine against three orcs or four orcs or something like that. So it's it's still a duel to an extent, but it just makes more of it. I think. I think what it does is it it broadens the boundaries of what painters can do for an entry. Um, I think that's something that it, that in my mind it does, and I understand. Yeah, the one v ones are really focused, really sort of like. Ribena strength kind of look at uh, uh, Ribena, Ribena strength. strength. We're there kicking we go. it off. How long are we in? How long uh, are we in? We are fifteen minutes in. Fifteen minutes in. Ribena strength. Sorry, there's right. your Jamesism for so, the. I'm, I'm very sorry. Well, it's uh, fine. You should. <laughs> yeah. Should we should we segue that into the uh, into the viewers' comments then? Because I found this interesting. Uh, JP Kimball nine four seven nine says, "I think on the back of your Siege Studios T-shirts, you should have all of the phrases uh, that James says on them." <laughs> We'll Talking about the t-shirts. We'll take, yeah, we'll yeah. take that. Yeah. Where, did you not get the memo, George? Yeah, I get the memo. Yeah, yeah. Like, Still waiting on my merch. Pack. Didn't get the memo. Didn't get any t-shirts. Didn't get any t-shirts. Yeah. yeah. We have to sort that, won't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I will take that into consideration. We might do a limited run with some some isms on it. Yeah. So, so yeah. It's like the podcast edition of the t-shirt. It's just got quotes from James. Yeah. 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 I'm no the, one will have a clue what you're wearing. I really want to like. I you wish just, I could have some just, sort of insight into your brain, like. You, they're just they're so off the cuff. They're yeah. mental things you've never heard. It's not you, like it's like parroting like classic phrases. There are some classic ones that do come out now and again, but they're, they're you know, I don't generally think speaking, they're... just throughout the day, you'll just say something like that, just nonchalant. It, the the ones that do you know what the interesting thing is? The classic ones are the ones that you sort of pause and think about and then you come out with. Like the ones that anyone says. And then the ones that just roll out of your mouth are the most insane like ones that no one's I ever showed heard you of. that model this morning. I went, how'd you like that Kipper? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, right. Bit of a bit of thank you all in the comments for, uh, for coming through for me on the last episode because the support for the refreshers was frankly overwhelming. Right. I want to get some Go on, do, read your comment. Well, uh, read your little s- stupid little comment. My little propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to he's trying to swerve it here to, in his favour. But well, I, uh, I, think, I think Joe's got something that 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 that, for that ruins that quite well, quickly. Well, Amy Snugs, uh, member of the team at Siege, says, uh, "I'm with you, George. Love some refreshers. Always get a big bag of retro sweets every Christmas from my nan-in-law. One of the best presents ever." So that is exactly on brand what I said about the Christmas box. Right. That sounds, that does sound lovely. And that is very nice. I put a poll out <laughs> about this. Um, I put, are refreshers an S tier suite as a grown adult? I don't like that you put at the end of that as a grown adult because you're implying that you're stupid. You've, you've intentionally phrased your poll to get people into the mindset of guilting themselves for liking refreshers that was the question though I was saying it for children maybe (laughs) for like little (laughs) stupid little kids maybe no so but the the general consensus was general consensus I I hate to say it George it was a landslide victory to (laughs) no Uh, 76% of people voted no it's not S tier as an adult um uh, 24% of people voted yes and one of those people was George <laughs> <laughs> trying to sway the numbers there George a little bit um, one, someone messaged me saying it's not even S tier as a kid so they, they, they even then they're saying even as a child I think you're getting too caught up on the uh, where you're ranking it that's down to personal taste but whether or not it's acceptable to eat as an adult is undeniably although again like people coming like, the people saying yes Seem to be members of the team. We've got Ned voted yes. I'm not being funny, Joe. Well. You've stacked this question up. You've sowed the seeds in their head before they even answered the question, and then you're surprised that results give you confirmation bias. Yeah, well, I'm just not saying, scientific. This I'm not scientific. I, I, I'm just, uh, the, I'm just sitting back, li- liking this. Well, fact. you said they're for, you said they're for kids, Joe. And uh, Bunyip Studios says my missus eats refreshers, and she's nearly sixty. Right. Look, I'm starting to realise my error in letting you pick the comments. <laughs> I will. I will say that the the. I'm sorry to to who is it? 
Bunyip Studios. Yeah. Sorry to them, Mrs. I, I don't mean to call them a child, but you've picked the comments and my research says otherwise. Well, I'm I'm a fair person, Joe. If there were any comments that were saying that Refresh has been... There actually wasn't right. any there, was, there, weren't, there weren't any comments at all saying that. I've so, not yeah. cherry-picked. I've just picked all of the Refreshers-related comments yeah. and they've all been positive in support well, of the Refreshers. So, I love the yeah. way that all of that spurred from me just saying a quick analogy. One of, one of your Jamesisms. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. one of your Jamesisms. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, Be on a t-shirt next if you week. like strong Ribena, let us know. In yeah, the comments. suppose yeah. suppose Ribena's S tier as well, is it? No, I hate Ribena. Oh, well, there, there we go. We're not going to argue about that, so it's fine. No. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, Nyab Stilgar says, "You you actually asked me to include this one. Uh, is the beardest is the bearded host a part of Contradiction <laughs> Cast, or am I crazy?" <laughs> right. I have some questions on this. Questions for your questions. So I'm going to answer your question with a question. What is that? I don't know. I'm not that. If that's a real person, then that's it's one of James's not, burner accounts. That's not me. <laughs> no, there no, are no, no not, not the comment being a real person. The person they're asking if oh, I right, am. Right. If that's a real thing, but I didn't know if this was like, if that's a real thing, like contradiction cast. I don't know what that is. I looked it up. I could not find it. If it is, or if that's like a funny way of saying that I was contradicting myself because I was. I brought it up in the episode. I think where I was saying like. um, my thing was about painting the same model 10 times or whatever. Mm. But then previously I've said about getting away from space Marines and stuff. And I did try and address that in the, in the, the podcast. I think both of those points could be valid. And I thought maybe that this was a funny way of saying that I was contradicting myself. Um, so just I like that, being referred to as the bearded host. I like that we've got to the point with the podcast where like third party viewers have no idea who we are. Yeah. Me. Yeah. I thought I thought uh, I also yeah, like the old bearded, bearded host. host when James has also got the beard going on. I got a uh, more noticeable beard, I would say. Okay. Yeah, no, I've, been, I've been, just darker. I've been, I've been cutting the lawn a bit more recently, so so yeah. And, and actually, yeah. To be fair, <laughs> to be fair, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to. I don't know if it's definitely that episode, but before we recorded, I shaved. I think you were shaving in yeah, your yeah, office. Yeah, yeah. And he shaved office. his beard in, in yeah. his office. He was shaving yeah, his beard. Shaving, yeah. So um, in the office, because you not have done that in the morning, that was <laughs> like a normal person. I was like, was really in, busy. I was like, you I was really busy. Recorded. And he was like, yeah, toothbrush busy. hanging out of his mouth. Yeah. Hey, look, when I get delayed by ten minutes walking the dogs, it it, it shunts the whole day back. Yeah. You know? so, so I'd be so. interested to know. Uh, here's my follow up questions. If someone else or that person could comment, let me know. Is that a real person you're comparing me to? Because uh, it's not me. <laughs> or is that? Um, is that just a funny way of saying I was contradicting myself? Um, or both. Or both. Or both. Yeah. Or, both yeah. or is it, yeah, really layered? To be continued. Stay if, tuned. <laughs> if, if I happen to look like someone who's on something called Contradiction Cast, and also that they're calling me out for contradicting myself, that's a very layered comment and I'll fair play. <laughs> Would you say it's an S-tier comment? That's an S-tier comment. It's an S-tier As a grown comment. adult. That's a grown adult. As a grown adult, not a child. A kid wouldn't understand it. <laughs> so, just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to accommodate for a variety of needs and budgets. Whether you want a centerpiece character for your army or a full-blown gaming force, we have what you need and we offer well above the industry standard in terms of painting quality and our service. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk. And in the month of September, new clients can get 5% off of any commission using code SEPTEMBER5. Uh, right. This is a uh, topic for this week. We want to talk about the five common mistakes that beginners make. Yep. James, as a seasoned uh, tutor running the siege courses all over the country, I'm sure you've seen a lot of uh, people from all experience. Yeah, yeah. Painting. yeah. This is not to call us the experts, obviously, but with a bit of experience under our belts. These yeah, are also just... the things that we personally have uh, have overcome. Yeah, I, I, look, I I've taught a lot of classes over the last eight years, um, and you do you do see a lot of things. Like you do see a lot of uh, things that you try and help people with, um, especially when they're they're new to painting miniatures. Number one, um, I think posture and hand bracing. Uh, I find a lot of people either sit very awkwardly, just don't sit close enough to the desk, don't sit with their elbows or forearms on the desc. Uh, hunch over a lot and there's a big re the biggest contributor to hunching over a desk is lighting um, and that reason for that is uh, 
we obviously massively advocate a, a, a daylight that's above you on an arm so that you can sit comfortably underneath it, raise the height so you're straight backed, and then um, and obviously can just sit comfortably with forearms and elbows and hands braced on the desk. It's interesting you say that because I would have guessed that that would have been like due to table height or chair height. It, or... Sometimes it can be table height, but what tends to happen is people will buy a smaller table light that's like just got a base and then it's just got like a little light. That's and, why I had. And, prefer, and, yeah. and, and what you'll do is you'll lean and crouch down to, to see under the light, if that makes sense. Hmm. Even if you have one of those small lights, like I've, I've done it on classes before where someone's bought like a big carry box or whatever for their gear and their paints and all that. I've literally picked up the carry box, put the carry box on the desk and then just pick the light up from the desk and put it on top of the carry box. And immediately they're like, oh, okay, I can just go under it now. Like it sounds silly, but like, but a big contributor to hunching over is lighting because you have one of those smaller lights and you do lean forward to try and get under it if that makes sense and it's something psychologically you just don't realize you just do it because you're trying to light the model and see what you're doing but so an easy way to solve that then is literally it's not even get a new light it's just put your light no not necessarily yeah yeah not necessarily if you don't you don't need to go and buy one what, big, big arm light what i eventually did obviously we blew your mind with using the lid of the Tupperware for the uh, thing. <laughs> That's a throwback. But when you use the lid of the Tupperware, you have the actual Tupperware spare. Uh-huh. Put your light on that. But now big the Tupperware. Not is, joking about TK Maxx now, are you, mate? Yeah. 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 Put a light on that. That's what yeah. I used to do. Big ups, everyone who's been listening since the, uh, the TK, TK Maxx Max. days. I've been there since TK Maxx, <laughs> yeah. 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 We actually had quite a few people in the comments say, like, oh, uh, I hope one there could say, uh, I was here since the refresher days or something <laughs> <Yeah>. like that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like, like, like posture uh, is really important, obviously for obvious reasons, if you're going to be painting for, you know, many, many years in, in you know, painting miniatures in the hobby and, and you know, and doing, and doing it, then you are going to have uh, posture problems and you can have back <laughs> I problems. love the idea of like Joe sat there putting his Tupperware and his lamp on top and he's like, in six years, this is going to pay dividends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the thing is, is like, it will, it will seriously give you problems down the line if you don't, if you don't do it right from day one um you know and I, I you might have a year or two where you 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 you're doing that and it doesn't affect you but you will start getting lower back pain and stuff like that and again i don't advocate anybody straining or being really sort of like firm with a with a hand or holding things really tight when they're painting and that tends to be because of not not bracing and like you should you should be able to comfortably hold the brush um and do pull strokes do push strokes with with comfort rather than strain um posture leads to that and also bracing leads to that massively as well um so so yeah you should be you know chest or stomach to the desk forearms on the table or elbows on the table and also brace with your with your hands together so like the various the thing i love about uh using the shot glasses for example is that because they are conical what it means is you can put your fingers around the top and this whole part of your hand becomes the area that you can bridge onto for any new listeners he's saying use a shot glass to hold the model yeah 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 yeah, yeah not apologies. to get drunk before you paint the yeah models. yeah sorry apologies i should have caveat, uh, caveated that um but yeah with 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 being able that to was ha- sorry that was something i can't remember what the episode number was but we went over that on a previous episode. yeah, yeah, yeah. Shot James, glasses, yeah. James did shot yeah we can glasses. link it or whatever i did I, jenga yeah, pieces and yeah we spoke else. about yeah. that but but yeah but having having multiple areas of bridging is really important so being able to bridge your hands together or either bridge directly onto the bit that's around the, the holder that you're using is really important um yeah and, and uh, i would always advocate an overhead light because that will immediately make you sit up straighter and closer to the desk because you can manipulate the arm etc so that's the that's, you know what i started doing i started dropping my chair that to effectively well, yeah. make the table Slightly taller. Higher. Yeah. Therefore, I can rest Put my wrists and my elbows. Under the lower. light more. Exactly. Yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. That's really helpful. I mean, if you do have like a, a, a gaming chair or whatever, like a secret lab chair, or if you have like a whatever, blah, blah, like being able to adjust it uh, and also still be comfortable and straight back. You don't need really... a gaming chair to have how you adjust. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, you can. Uh, no, I know you can get different can chairs. You can get that function but... on other chairs. Yeah. But, but the gaming no, chair looks cooler. It looks cooler and it's more comfortable. And it's, I find. it is more comfortable. Yeah. To be fair, I used to use just any old chair and like any old office chair or whatever until we got the secret lab chairs in the office. And I was like, oh, okay, that's actually incredibly comfortable. I actually did that a couple before I started at Siege. I got one of the secret lab chairs. And then when I started here, I was like, oh, thank God, I got secret lab chairs. <laughs> <laughs> they are they are like the thing is whether, whether even in the sitting at a desk and writing emails all day or whether you're painting that it, it 
posture and comfort comfort are really really important and you know it just allows you to do that thing for longer without potentially causing long-term damage or long-term strains or frustration for the future when you want to if you could, if it's one of those things right where like if you're going to be sat in it for like many many hours and it's going to last you many many years i mean i've gone through i'm not saying necessarily to buy a secret labs chair obviously there's plenty of other companies but i used to get through like i don't know about you like an office chair a year like just from the amount like of like 100 or... quid chairs I've bought that I've eventually worn through and I'm just sat on bare metal or plywood. Yeah. Mm. Finally making that, I'd say that was probably actually one of the biggest, I wish I thought this before on a previous episode, but probably one of the best investments I've made in my hobby setup was spending some good money and getting a nice chair. Yeah. I mean, the thing, the other thing to talk about and the other thing to, t- to bolt onto this as well is that like, I totally understand, and this is from conversations I have with hundreds of students on classes like over the years, like not everybody has a proper painting room or has a, a desk set up or has whatever like a lot of people do paint at the coffee table or do paint at their dining table or whatever in there yeah yeah i totally understand yeah. that that there are different situations and circumstances out there for people but all i would say is that whether you're painting at a coffee table or whether you're painting at a dining table just trying to make sure that in some shape or form you are sitting comfortably straight backed arms braced on this on the flat surface and whether that's if it's a coffee table sitting on the floor cross cross legged and so that you're at a similar sort of height so you can brace which would probably help you if you've got one of those shorter lights as well because it would lower you and the height light would become higher if you're at a dining table buying a chair that you can store somewhere that when you put it up the table it is more comfortable and allows you to sit in that position that's a better trade-off than than just putting yourself in a situation where you are hurting your back yeah i think there's like um there's a middle ground to be had where like we're not saying you need all this really expensive stuff in no, the fancy definitely. station to improve your experience. Definitely, yeah. I always get a bit like it's when more, we're recommending stuff, especially like we're just talking about like a casually talking about a four hundred pound chair. Yeah. More like, than that in some cases. Yeah, or like yeah, more yeah. than that. Like, um, I always get a bit conscious of it because obviously not everyone can afford a four hundred pound chair. There's plenty of uh other options. Um, but then I remember like we are also talking to people that spend like hundreds of pounds on models that's interesting <laughs> so I find if it, you are spending this it, is not it, to call anyone out obviously but I do find interesting that people I get it to a degree but I do find interesting that people will spend loads of money on a new range of paints or a load of new models that are probably just going to sit and be on the sprues for uh, years and years in a box You, it, it's not so much about spending money on those things it's maybe just considering what you're currently spending on and maybe i'll be honest within the hob within your hobby budget right i'm saying maybe instead of buying some new models or instead of buying that new paint range you put it towards an investment like a better lamp or a desk that's a bit higher up or i i only bought any of that stuff new lamp new chair um good brushes i only bought any of that once my like pile of shame got so much where i was like i literally should not be buying any more models Mm. like if i'm going so i was just buying models ahead of all that i do get it like that's that's the thing that we're all interested in that's what it's way more appealing to spend 100 pound on models than save that 100 pound put it towards a really nice chair Mm. or something it's way more appealing depends how into chairs you are (laughs) yeah it depends how into chairs well it depends if it's got the function to change the height (laughs) um (laughs) Um, Revolutionary so I do get it yeah so I, it's a bit of a fine line I always get a bit thingy. but what I was going to say is to James's point of not needing the best setup and things like that um, not going to like out them or, or say the full story or anything but we've had people join the team that when you hear different people's painting situations um, and then you see how good they are at painting yeah, yeah. it will make you realise Oh, what am I doing? Like, I, I had a, that it's moment. A, it's the sure. lazy perfectionist thing again. Yeah, yeah. Like that, I I get that with. I've got to make sure the setup's perfect. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to paint the perfect model. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll get people join the team, and they'll explain what their setup is, and it's like what I would have, you know, what anyone could have a setup of. Yeah, yeah. Um, in some cases, not even using a table because of like room in the room that's available and stuff. And then painting some of the most incredible models I've ever seen. And it's like... There is clearly okay. zero correlation between your setup and how good of a yeah, painting. Okay. That, it's not that. Yeah. It's like I was just going through things of, oh, it must be this why I don't yeah. paint that good. Oh, it must be this. The, the only thing I would I would say, and just, just not to counter, but just to say that, is if you have someone who's maybe not in the most comfortable situation for painting and they're painting amazingly, 
how much better would they paint if they were? I do agree with it's that. It's not going to hurt. Yeah, I do agree with that. that. That's why that's the point I'm trying to make. It's a quality like, of life like, thing. You're spending hours yeah. doing something, so you know, but you know, put that benefit yourself. Yeah. By if you're going to be there for hours, exactly, make yourself as comfortable as possible. And we've gone through before as well, like clean space gives you a better mindset and things like that. I don't disagree with all that. I'm just saying you can find some level of of what we're saying here within your budget and space and whatever. I don't have big space at all to do painting. Um, so I, have to, I have to, I have like a, I don't have a painting desk. I have like a multi-use desk yeah. where like I have to, okay, now my painting stuff's on it. Okay. Now my painting stuff's off it. Like yeah. I don't have set up with all the um, racks and everything. Racks and yeah. everything. They're, they're off to the side in a separate thing. And then I just go and get the ones that I need and stuff like that. So um, everyone's got different, different priorities in that stuff, I suppose. But, um, but, the, the the fundamental thing is on on that note and on that topic is literally just assess where you work and 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 just go right okay is this number one the best function I've got from it and also secondly and most in my point opinion most importantly is is it is it comfortable am I straining am I bracing am I bending over like leaning over you know those kind of things are things that you really should you should assess your workspace because it directly affects all the things that you try and do at that painting desk. Um, yeah, I think it's really, that's, that's, that's a really important part. I think it's something that one of the, one, of the, I think one of the things that I've instantly seen the most of when teaching are people that are constrained by a light that's very low. They lean over and there you can see them not being able to brace or they sit really far back from the table. And it's like, if you were closer, you'd be able to be way more braced and way more comfortable. And you that shaky hand potentially that you're experiencing won't happen as much because you you can relax a bit more you know um and that's one of the one of the things let's move on from that then so what's one of the next things that you see uh people making as a mistake building the models really quickly without thinking of like choices for parts and that, the painting approach you get super excited that you're like oh i've bought this new kit you know and you first get into it and you're like, oh, i'm just gonna put the models together blah blah and i'm not talking about sub assemblies i know that's gonna trigger you joe but like i'm not <laughs> i'm about, actually but, painting but, in a sub assembly currently you're painting that, in a sub assembly you're, I'm, you're okay so uh, we'll, Do you need to talk? <laughs> we'll we'll talk about it probably in not next episode, probably the episode after or something when the model's done. But I'll uh, there was a reason behind it. I thought it would be funny for me to. I tried to do everyone's, so I thought like, oh, I'll paint in sub assemblies, and I'll I'm using like shot glasses instead of like what Jenga. I would normally <laughs> use and stuff like that. Um, but genuinely, I went from full sub assemblies to within like seconds like a few <laughs> minutes in a few he's minutes on the pallet and he's like no i can't within do it. a few can't minutes do it. i just he, like he looked at on the shot glass can't do it i just looked at it and i was like no so i've reduced the amount of sub assemblies but i'm still doing sub assemblies yeah. but yeah so i'm not not triggered have you ever way. done this james have you ever had a sub assembly where bits of it still come off as in, it's like I've got a sub assembly arm, but don't worry, I can still take the shoulder pad off. It's blue tacked. <laughs> I have one of those at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I, what, what I mean is like um, it is where you 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 get a new kit and you and you've been especially with the way things are now. You see it go up on, on community or you see it go up on a, on a company's website. You get super excited. The pre order date goes up. You pre order it. You go down to the, you pick it up or it arrives or whatever. You get the box. You, you know you, um, when you combine that with being new into this as well so you've got that excitement of it being this whole new thing that you're getting into and then you've got the excitement of this thing that you've loved from the moment you've seen it and it's been obviously there's been a wait you know of to get it and then you get it and and, and beginners will just put them all together really quickly and then the painting thought begins at that point once it's built whereas taking a second to go all right okay well i really like that shoulder pad or i really like that or i really like this or i really like that oh do you mean in terms of if it's like a multi-part kit choosing yeah, the, yeah it's like, just like it's deck, just, it's even just, if it's not necessarily a war gear option if it's like decorative right yeah like a box yeah of it has loads of different shoulder pads or yeah. different head options or helmets it's things like it's things like uh a lot of models don't come with like purity seals attached for example or they don't come or they come with like a, a different topper for the backpack or something like that all those kind of things like it's it's just building the model really quickly getting it built because you want to get it built because you want to get and you want to get onto the painting but not but not taking a second to go right okay before i get through that i'm just going to pick the bits or have a look at the parts and think oh i like this i like this or maybe i don't that that might be a bit more difficult to paint or maybe i don't think my skills at the point where i can paint that yet or i'm not sure on how to paint that like taking a brief second to go right okay and looking at the kit and looking at the parts before rushing through the, the build of it and getting it built i think that helps massively i think a lot of sometimes new new painters do just build the model really quickly and to get onto the painting because they're super excited to paint 
But then once they've built it, they're like, oh, I've actually, I've stuck that on now. But I, do you know what? I really like that 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 head or that topper or that shoulder pad or, or whatever, you know what I mean? And I think having that brief moment of like absorbing what's actually presented to you in the kit, but with a painting mindset and thinking, oh, do I want to paint that or do I want to do that? I think that helps. I know a lot of people will kind of do that during the build, but when, you, when you're new and you're getting into this, I think the excitement of getting it built and getting onto that fun painting stage is sometimes blurs the thoughts when it comes to actually how you're going to paint well, it. Sometimes what's coolest looking as well isn't necessarily best suited for the paint scheme or yeah, yeah, the, yeah. composition if you're doing like a big piece or something like yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes like law based reasons yep. that they might, yeah. oh, it's probably better for them to have this than this or. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think, I think just that slight pause to just reflect on what's in the kit and just, and think of it when the painting mindset will, will really help because it just means you can make choices that are more tailored to perhaps where you're at as a painter or make choices, which uh, are going to test you or vice versa, you know? So that's, that's kind of like something that I've, I've noticed. I also think it like helps having that mindset helps get you into kind of embracing like, the therapeutic nature that building and cleaning can be. <laughs> it can, yeah. Like, I Some used people to, hate building, but yeah. I used to hate um, building and cleaning. Like, I used to, you know, when I was starting, do what you were just saying. And like, I want to, I'll tell you now, I never once put an extra purity seal on a model. <laughs> not <laughs> once. Not once in my life did I ever... Um, if I was painting some marines, put an extra purity seal on because it's more to paint. Are you one I mean, of those people who's like building a box of tack marines and you're like, they don't need belts. They yeah, don't yeah, need yeah. Holsters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't need that. They don't need that. Yeah. Um, they lost the pistol in battle. Um, <laughs> um, Narrative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I definitely used to be like that. And it's so funny, like looking back, um, when I got back into to Warhammer, um, was mostly with Barrett, who you've met. Yeah. I don't think you've met Barrett, but, no, um, um, and we like, we were so polar opposite in terms of when it came to building mm -hmm. in that I would still want to, well, maybe not polar opposite, but like, I would want to get through it quickly, but I would, I would follow the instructions and make sure that I was getting everything right. He would literally like just chuck the instructions away, just have a look at what parts he's got and go, right, bang, 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 bang. That goes together like that. That looks like it goes together there. Yeah, that looks fine. Whatever, done. And that I could I could never have done that. So I wasn't at that level. No, no. Okay, yeah. But um I love building models because I like I do this like make believe thing, right? You know when you see those like videos of like someone like building a watch. Yeah. And they've got like the velvet gloves on. Yeah. And they're like doing everything all precise. I like to feel like that. <laughs> it's more like escapism. I thought you were gonna say <laughs> that you do like you know the the animation they released of the um, making a space for yeah, yeah. where like the armor's coming on and stuff. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say that you have your little model there and you like have the shoulder well, maybe, coming up. You're making it on the sounds. You're making all the sounds. You're like, Shh, and you're doing it's the like voiceover. Helmet. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, and you're like <laughs> doing the voiceover to yourself, like every single marine. Um, I mean, that would take ages to ages to to, to make them. But, fun, someone though, but, someone but, must have done like a fan made version of that with like an if not, model. it's yeah. gonna happen. So someone's yeah. got to do that. Someone's yeah. got to do that. Um, yeah, I forget the point. Uh, oh, the um, yeah, the building and cleaning thing. Like I always used to be like that, and weirdly, even just recently, like I did, obviously starting working here, realized the importance of building and cleaning. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I, I always just used to like look past mold lines and stuff like that. I don't care, like, whatever. I wish I did acknowledge that stuff sooner to think it would have improved my painting quicker because it's impossible to get better at painting when the model's not clean properly. We spoke about that on a previous episode, didn't we? It's like yeah, that's yeah. shooting yourself in the foot before you start the race, isn't it? I mean, yeah. no good paint job can overcome but it wasn't, a mold line. <laughs> it wasn't until literally this year, like even so, it, acknowledging that it was more important and paying more attention to it and stuff, it wasn't until this year I was talking to um, Liam Dempsey. I think, I don't know when. Maybe at when. Fest. Maybe at Fest. Or it might have even been before that when we were in like Gibraltar or something. But I remember him saying like, oh, I love building and cleaning. Yeah. Like I love just building and cleaning the models because um, we was obviously talking about painting models for him. And he was like, yeah, I love building and cleaning. And I was like, oh yeah, I suppose it can be enjoyable actually. 
can be quite nice. I have a friend who doesn't paint and doesn't play the games. He literally just buys the boxes, models, puts them together, and then that's it. I guess that is like the um, like the Gundam stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. mostly just it's yeah. just building yeah. the models, right? That's the fun thing. It, yeah, for, for me, it's it is. I obviously it's, for me, it's the painting is very important, but I think the building and cleaning is on par. I think because and and I, I think a lot of people hate it because they want to get onto the the painting, arguably for the right reasons because they want to get the models painted, but. If you overlook that, um, then then I think it, it's a bit of a shame because there are things that massively detract from a well painted model if they're not done correctly or not done neatly. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but to, to to touch upon it, like the the whole thing I was saying is like not so much obviously the quality. If you want to use an analogy, not so much like a painter choosing a, a worn canvas or a pristine canvas. It's more choosing the right size canvas for what they're actually going to render and paint. And that's the way I'm trying to basically explain it. It's like you're talking more about deciding the options, and deciding stuff, the options. The quality, yeah, the yeah. Picture. The quality, build and clean it really well. Like either way, respect irrespective of like whether you're just going, oh, I'm going to build it and get it built, ready to paint, or or take a moment to go, right, okay, well, I'm building the captain. Comes with a power fist, comes with a sword. Maybe I'm not so good at metallics, uh, or I'm not so good at blended blendings for the sword, but the power fist. Um, the power fist, I know I can edge highlight that really sharply. So then, like making choices, or equally, you could be like, oh. I was going to do a power fist for this, but actually, if I do a sword, I can paint it in a different color that contrasts the armor nicely. Yeah. And that'll make a nicer yeah. color yeah. scheme for the model. Right Correct. There. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. It's those, it's those, it's that little pause to literally just go, right, I know I'm going to build this. I'm going to enjoy building it and have fun building it and do it really well. But rather than just getting it done without any of the, of the aforethought for the painting, it's literally just going, right, I'm going to, I'm going to make some choices or have some thought about the parts I'm going to choose and bits and bobs so that, so that I can enjoy the painting aspect even more if that makes sense so yeah have you got one final uh, thing that you've noticed beginners doing yeah i think from from a lot of the airbrush airbrush classes and uh, the airbrush sections on courses that i've taught over the years um i think that the airbrush is this kind of like pedestal wonder product that a lot of people wonder uh, product yeah like that. That, a, wonder product. That a lot of people think that that you 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 kind of like you get it and it makes you amazing straight away and, and arguably like it it is a very 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 important tool like very important tool when it comes to miniature painting because it does save you time and improve quality of base coats. You know, we've spoken about you would never paint a tank with a brush again after using an airbrush, etc. Um, but it's similar to sort of like when you buy models and you want to get them built and you want to get them get them done straight away. I think a lot of people will buy an airbrush the first time they get when they get into it. They see obviously a YouTube video, they, their friend's got an airbrush or whatever the case may be, and how they find out about the airbrush in general, and they'll just buy one and pick a model up straight away. And I think that's a huge, huge uh, mistake because it massively makes you think that the tool is is a is a is not as good as it's supposed to be, or it makes you feel that you're not good enough. If that makes sense, spending I've literally had classes where someone's come on the class and they've never picked up an airbrush in their life, and they've sat there with an airbrush with a bit of cardboard or paper with some water with a bit of ink in it, and they've practiced dots, lines, transitions, smooth passes, all that kind of stuff for, for thirty minutes. And then you give them the model and then they get some paint and try and put it on. The difference between the person who's had that half an hour of practice and the person who's super excited to use it and picks it up and goes, and makes a big splodge on the model straight away or layers too thick. Especially or, if, God forbid, it's like an expensive <clears throat> model or one yeah, exactly. you've spent ages painting. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think that's a big thing that like people who are getting into this and who are getting new into the industry and new into painting miniatures, I think like if you are going, going to go down the route of buying an airbrush, Perfect. I advise it to everybody. Like, you know, it is a tool that you should have, you should use if you're looking to be efficient, save time, maximize quality, all those things. But don't just maybe use it straight away on a miniature. Practice on cardboard, practice on some paper, practice on something. Um, you could, I suppose, practice on a model that you're not, that you don't really care about. But I, I think practicing those core competencies of trigger control distance from distance from object and obviously I think probably both of those things to be honest i would say practice on 2d paper card what have you and then graduate to a test model or a model you're not happy with potentially and then yeah. go on to yeah, or, obviously doing it on a 3d volumetric shape is different than doing it on oh, the paper right yeah yeah but i would say that doing it on a test model even before you go onto your yeah, but you maybe that's the good process then is do it on paper and card first on a 2D so you can just control the trigger, learn that the, the biting point of the trigger where paint and air comes out at the same time if you're using a dual, a dual action and all, all those different bits and then maybe progress onto a, a, a volumetric shape. 
Maybe you're not you're not going to pick up on the the directionality of like where you're spraying from and things like that and the volumes because obviously if you've got something blocking in another part of the model when you're spraying it with an airbrush the airbrush only goes it only fires paint in a straight line right? yeah yeah and you're not picking up that technique from testing lines on paper no correct yeah 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 i mean that maybe that's the thing to do maybe it is to do the paper uh, or do card or whatever and then and then maybe get something that maybe maybe a miniature but or maybe even just a volume so like a sphere a cube i'd say a model uh, i mean everyone's i'm sure has got some test models or something yeah models potentially you can get yeah. some like ones i'm already. talking if you're new and you've literally bought an airbrush and you've got maybe like you've not got like the, the Aladdin's cave of grey shame, you know. No, but like even, G, even GW do like the free. Like, in the I'm sense saying, if, if you're completely new, then I would say just do it on your first models because, as I've said before, your first models are going to be rubbish anyway. So teach, treat your first models as your test. I think most people yeah. get an airbrush later into the hobby as well. Not, not I don't know. Start, like, I, 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 I don't yeah. know. I, I mean, on some classes, I've had I've had painters that have I've had students that have been literally they've been in the industry in the hobby for like a month and they've bought an airbrush straight away I would so they say, must they must have watched a video or they must have known somebody that has one and they've just got and that's in the in, that's painting miniatures and has gone well you definitely need an airbrush or you definitely need this nothing wrong with getting one if you when you're very new hmm. i think just applying that hour half hour of practice before you even go near a model is is something that you you should do uh, i would in, say in terms of practice models actually even if you are new um just get some like ones that are already painted really badly going for cheap on eBay or something. Yeah, that can work. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I have the I have a Rhino that was one of the first models I ever bought. Um, and I, God knows how many coats of paint that's had. That is literally my, like just test. I just test the consistency on it before I like, um, Go on to the model. The rhinos model. are like a dime a dozen. I think it's on Paul Hammer podcast. They said like rhinos are free. People don't know this, but everyone has got <laughs> yeah. rhinos. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I just it's one of the first models I've ever got, and it's just been caked in paint just from initially. That so practicing. old, they're just everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. initially everywhere. practicing it, but um, now it's like I just test out different paints on it and stuff. So yeah, getting some old models and just you don't want them to look good at the end of the yeah. day. Well, so it's gonna doesn't matter. Just keep going over. I them. mean, GW have the the intro magazine thing. You can get they're yeah, really cheap, and they also have. I'm pretty sure you get free model in store if you go in. I think they do that like now. Yeah, think, yeah, yeah. That's it's yeah. A different model every month. I do think, however, depending on how how chill your local <laughs> store manager is, I think you do have to build them in store. That's to fine. walk away with them. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but just I mean, you can't just pop in and go. Can I have one of them? Yep, cool. No, no, I get later. that. I'm just saying in terms of uh, accessibility for a, for a test model. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you have to build them in store. It's yeah. obviously to get people in the stores and stuff. It's a really cool idea, actually. Yeah, that, that's the only thing. That's the only thing that I've seen that a few people do is they, they they buy an airbrush very early on, um, and they don't do that. They grab a model and start painting with it and start using it, and then the the one of the first things they were saying when they come to the class in the airbrush section is, yeah, I bought it, I tried a model, and I didn't pick it up because I made such a mistake on it, and it's like. It's kind of like the expectation compared to the execution is very far because of because of not doing that practice. Well, this is the that. the YouTube doesn't tell you the full story thing, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I think yours was uh, yours was a bit similar, wasn't it? Your uh, painting mistake on the uh, the airbrush front or spraying models. Kind of. Front. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't quite the airbrush front. It was before the airbrush days. But I think I just didn't. Um, I, I didn't really take into consideration the about like spraying too much primer on. Mm. Like, and it's not until you see like, pro, I, I think I just used to just cake models in it because I would have missed like a little spot. And then you're trying to get that little spot and you end up just like flooding the model in, in more spray. You mean like primer. when you've got like a little bit under the armpit that's like still showing yeah, through. Exactly. So you go, I'm going to spray the whole front of the model again. Yeah, yeah. I do think since having. I've touched on it before where I'll prime with um, color forge black mm -hmm. and then I'll, if the model's going to be black, obviously I'll spray with black after yeah. still or I'll airbrush the main color for whatever the model is. And I just think being okay with some of the primer not covering like little details as long as the base coat does cover it, that's not done me any wrong now. And I wish I kind of was a bit more less liberal with the primer than I was originally. I think within reason. Like providing it's not like a massive area. Oh uh, yeah, I'm talking it's hard to describe, right? I do know what you mean though. It's like it's almost like a color gradient rather than like a it's more noticeable because I've been painting with the Warhammer Heroes, they're uh 
they're blue plastic mm. and obviously I've sprayed black over it. So that's more noticeable. You can see it coming through. Yeah. Um, what I'm getting at is obviously by the end of you doing your first base coat, you don't want any of the plastic showing through. Yeah. I'm not saying leave plastic showing through. Just, yeah, just I'm saying it. what you can't get with the prime. Sometimes it's worth, if you've missed a little bit with a primer, I wish I was more okay with just leaving that because I'll get it with a base coat and nothing's, You've been seeing a little armpit or something. Nothing's going to actually be touching that to take. You're saying that leaving a bit of off. bare plastic is worse than the alternative of spraying primer over it again and gunking up all the details. Better than the alternative. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. I yeah. think yeah. that leads on to a, 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 an issue that does happen with new people that do get do get into this. They buy the spray can and spray cans are obviously used in all manner of different ways, as in like for different things. And I think with miniatures the delicacy of how you apply it is 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 way higher than say for example if you were spraying a bit of metal outside or spraying something like you that the, the use of the can is what i'm talking about so a lot of people that i've seen using cans like that are very new into the hobby will hold down the the percussion cap on the top and they'll hold that down constantly while spraying and that is completely uncontrolled and you're doing passes with the can and putting on lots of layers of individual passes Whereas really one of the first things I'll say to people in classes about primer with a can is that you should use the percussion cap or you should use the, the trigger on the, on the, on the spray can exactly the same as how you would use the trigger on an airbrush and burst fire whilst moving. It's because what that does is it gives you a control of application. So you're doing the individual passes, the push down and movement at the same time. And also you can split your attention between angling the model whilst you're doing the individual bursts to to cover all those areas and hopefully by doing that you will then have be able to you'll, get every, you'll get every area of it and give it a solid base coat a solid uh, undercoat if that makes sense but i think the one of the big mistakes is that and this is what happens because prime like spray cans have obviously pigment they have propellant and they have medium in them so they've got way more than just putting a paint into an airbrush and diluting it if that makes sense so the layers that you're going to put on, and because it is designed to be an undercoat, the Chaos Black or the Color Forge Black or whatever primer that you use, um, if you do hold it down and just go like this, you're gonna you're gonna gunk up details with very thick paint very quickly, um, and I think that's one of the mistakes that a lot of new, new painters do or new hobbyists do do is they buy a spray can and they'll just hold that hold that trigger down and go like this and it just you, you, you're completely uncontrolled in the execution if that makes sense yeah um, I mean I, I was never doing that I feel like I, I know people do that but I think instinctively for whatever reason it just felt right to do like bursts yeah I think and George will like this I think it does say it on the instructions of most spray cans do love reading the especially when they're tailored to miniature painting I think it tells you to do bursts yeah um, but yeah I think for me it would just be like Obviously now, more experienced, more controlled, like you say, I yeah. am able to fully cover the model yeah, yeah, yeah. in a controlled fashion with a thin primer. Yeah, yeah. But back then, I used to just like see a tiny little bit and think, oh, I've got to get rid of it. And then just end up putting loads more Wacking coats of primer on <laughs> yeah. to get rid of this tiny little bit that you can just, I could have just covered with a base coat yeah. and it wouldn't have rubbed off because it's inside it's in an armpit or whatever and in turn you wouldn't have gone cut in turn I wouldn't have had this really thick primer yeah like yeah I think that that was a, a mistake that that I think it it's it stands out as a mistake for me because it was something that I just never even addressed as a mistake I just used to be like oh this primer's thick isn't it just, just like well no yeah because I'm putting it on like that so on that note as well I've also got something that is going to tie in directly to this week's hobby hack at the end of the episode so stick around for that but the can's distance from the object as well is actually really crucial because there is and again touching on your point on on labels I think it does say on most cans the the optimal distance that you should hold the can so it can read a spray can instructions but he can't read only when he wants to so i'm going to assume this is because he wants to disprove that are you going to no, go no, against no, no, the no, label no, no i'm not going against oh, okay. it actually right. but i, I thought got, it was going to be good, he I only got, reads them when he wants to go against them but i've got a valid point as to why there's loads of warning symbols on the cans george there's there none is, on the yeah. vallejo ones yeah so yeah, that's, well that's we, we won't get into the international law of the <laughs> european Union. <laughs> there's no big red 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 uh skull and crossbone symbols on yeah. uh on the on the thinner and cleaner but anyway um so distance from, from the object or distance from target when using the can is also really crucial distance because from target. what it is from he's target. locking in yeah, yeah. <laughs> steady I don't know. distance from target yeah. steady <laughs> steady <laughs> so 
the 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 distance that you hold the can from the objects as well is really crucial purely because obviously as the paint atomizes when it leaves the nozzle of the can it's drying in that distance from from the can to the object obviously it's because it's been atomized so if you are further away from the object there's more distance for that paint and medium to travel which means it's going to be drying more over that distance when it hits the object um if it, if it's further away you will get a more powdery finish as well not to overcomplicate it as well but the distance thing is weather dependent and temperature so dependent i was about as well. to say it this is, yeah. i i always thought that that was way too granular way to think about it it's not going to make that much of a difference it does but the distance mixed with the weather genuinely makes so much of a difference it's the same, in the same way that with the airbrush your paint thinness and consistency versus the distance from the model Correct. that's the same effect yeah. so yeah. if that's something you're familiar with apply that to yeah. your spray cans it, do you know what like even though they're very different they're used for very different purposes, as in like undercoating, maybe priming if you're using the color can, like your Mephiston reds or McCray blues or whatever, blah, blah. Go straight to Mephiston red, Joe. Uh, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Don't get, don't trigger me, please. Um, but, but the, 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 the way that the can works and the functionality is actually very similar to an airbrush in, in a lot of a lot of extents. Obviously, you know the paint being put through it is very different in the way that the makeup and stuff. But but yeah, I think distance from from the object or target is uh, is uh, is is really really crucial. Um, so do read the can and do follow the optimal distance. I'm not going to uh, be able to help myself next time I come to spray a model. Now I'm just going to be like, stay on target. target can, we, <laughs> can we have target <laughs> slide? Can someone edit the uh, the trench run from uh, a yeah. new home? <laughs> and as he's locking on to the yeah. to the death star, <laughs> it's just a space marine. <laughs> that's <laughs> a it. Space marine yeah. with a spray. Gun. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, so yeah, so I think that's really important. But the hobby hack will, that we're going to give this week will help in oh, case a little that tease is, for the hobby hack. Little tease. Yeah, little tease for it. I'll yeah. uh, I'll round out the topic then with uh with my mistake that I made, which was I was so obsessed with blending as smooth as possible. Yep. That I would kill all of the contrast on my models mm -hmm. because the more you try to blend something naturally the smaller the change in value is going to be mm -hmm. and all my models for the longest time it's like yeah they're smooth but they have no contrast on them whatsoever and that's why i struggle with nmm in the like couple of times that i've tried it my brain can't the truth comprehend. comes out the <laughs> truth comes out that's why <laughs> 10 episodes like later yeah i can't bring myself to like leave with the NMN thing. I can't bring myself to leave like a harsh line on something. My brain is like, well, I have to blend it out. And then you blend it out and then it's you basically it. yeah. gone. It's like you've never done smooth, it. But then yeah. the thing is, like, I think the way to immediately stamp that out is have a look at real life reference of gold, silvers, like like light, like candelabras or like door handles. Oh, it's obviously like apparent. That. It's just yeah. that thing in my brain yeah. of like on the blending thing. I mean, it, I'm not, I don't really struggle with it now so much. No, 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 think, no. But no. that being okay with bigger value jumps obviously brings out more and more details in the model, which is why I like the box art style was like very edge highlighted, very heavy on that front. Yeah. That was something that I'm not sure how applicable that necessarily is to other people. That's definitely something that I was uh, struggling with. I know a lot of people say like, oh, the model needs more contrast and that can be for a myriad of reasons. But for me, it was the smoothness thing mm -hmm. that yeah, I my think mind. I'm the same. I just hate when my blends are so smooth and I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> I'll finish the model and I'll be like, this is the smoothest blends I've ever seen. It's so like, smooth. It looks like one, one color. color. Yeah, it is. I'll like, yeah. I'll spray the model that we were just talking about. I'll, you know, target acquired. And then I'll just be like, damn, these blends. Like, they're so, <laughs> I don't know what to, yeah. No, I do get what you're saying. Uh, we, interestingly, you say like, you don't know how applicable it is to other people. We've had multiple conversations with team over the years who are like still here or not here. And, and I remember at one point, at one stage, one of the biggest tips that we were having to give to people were like, don't be scared that jump, jump. your final edge highlight is going to be a stark mm -hmm. edge highlight. Like it, it is a common thing where it's like you do get a bit wary of the color jump, the stark jump. But the, the it's very much trust the process, isn't it? And then the end product is going to look better for it. it it's almost like muscle memory because you do you do get to a point where you look you start selecting colors when you're trying to do either transitions or maybe even for highlight stages on the model and things like that. Like it doesn't necessarily just have to translate just to blending, but like edge highlighting when you're doing the chunky, the, the first thin, the next part of the thin, the the next bit of the thin, then the dot highlight or whatever, like 
bear in mind it's on a 28 mil model and to visually see all those stages you do need to have a greater scope of color jump to allow that and also that's before we even talk about color desaturating one, a little bit once it dries because it does desaturate a tiny bit as obviously especially when you start mixing as well yeah correct yeah so so i think obviously you can go too crazy and the jump be like a blooming mean, long jump i mean jump if that makes sense but like you long know jump, jump. Jump, long, long jump jump jump, jump. Long, yeah long, long jump, jump limbing jump. jump yeah thanks james but uh yeah we won't clip that one uh, but, uh <laughs> <laughs> i i i feel for you there because i would know what to call what to say it's no ribena it's yeah, no ribena yeah, yeah. it's no ribena um but the, the, the what i'm trying to get at is you can go too far like yeah. you can the jump that you make can be so extreme that it does look like the edges are literally on fire or glowing you the, know the classic is um highlighting black with white yeah that yeah. being yeah it's on the same scale but like that's too far yeah yeah um, i think it's too, it's too much like so 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 yeah i i would i would just say like you that kind of color muscle memory if you want to call it anything i think that comes with just experimenting and again as a as a beginner you're you're not going to have that so so you probably are going to be a bit more restricted in or oh, if i use this green i'm only going to use this green to highlight it whereas most likely you probably need to go three or four colors higher to, to make a sizable disparity in difference of color to visually see it, if that makes sense so so yeah question of the week time thank you everyone for submitting your questions in the uh, comment section for question of the week if you have something that you'd like to ask us and have us answer on the show please do leave a comment on the youtube version of this podcast got a good one this week love this username uh pretzelmeister <laughs> solid name says uh i'm having trouble finding the motivation to paint do you have any advice all right this is like a hot it's like a hotline this isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. I think please it's, help i think it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's, situ it's situational because obviously we like, so i'm going to address him by the formal name so pretzel my stuff um obviously we're going to take it as a generalist question because there's no specific like i'm painting this and i'm struggling with this or whatever but i think in my opinion, I, I would paint something different to what you're painting. I know we've touched upon it on other episodes before, but I do really think that when you paint something that's so different from the thing that you paint all the time, be it color, be it model, be it faction, be it game system, be it whatever, that's going to help you to kind of hit the reset button on motivation because it just gives you something different to focus on. I'm going to throw something into that because people always think like, oh, I'm painting Space Marines, try painting a different faction. I'm going to rule that out. Try painting like a scale model car yeah, or yeah, yeah. a bust yeah. or a 75 mil yeah. fantasy figure based on a movie. Like go completely off base. Yeah, it's, it's having um, multiple things on your kind of whip shelf at once, isn't it? Like Variety. And I think go, going, on, <laughs> going on the um, topic of the episodes, almost, um, talking about the building and cleaning thing, if you start treating building and cleaning as as an activity in in itself, something to focus on, if you're not motivated to paint this evening, but you've got six boxes of models that need building, just kind of be okay with the fact that like, I don't really fancy painting, but I'm going to build them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put some effort into building them. Yeah. And as we've also touched on, nothing gets you pumped to paint like building new models because yeah, you just want to rush and get paint on them. Mm. So having a little break from it, while still working on a different skill, or if you want to start maybe learning sculpting, so things like that, you can still Definitely. benefit your hobby progress without having to paint. If you have to force the motivation, it's it's not always going to work out, I think. But also I would recommend, I think, episode one of this podcast, we spoke about inspirational painting <laughs> moments and things, yeah, things yeah. that really got us like rare into paint um and uh, we go over a few things in there and i think if you are near i don't know where mr meister lives <laughs> but um if you're near somewhere that has you know a shop with a, a really nice selection of models on show if you happen to be in the uk and you can get to warhammer world do the exhibition not nothing will get you motivated to paint like going through that exhibition yeah at warhammer world like i'm you know god knows where, where this person lives they might not be able to do that but um if it turns out they live in nottingham then they've probably been too much and it doesn't have to be <laughs> um, desensitized to the uh yeah, to the yeah. but just 
just uh, seeing amazing models in person. I agree. Yeah, Warhammer well, World is worth motivated. like a significant pilgrimage. That's just that is travel. the right word to just call it. It is it, worth because it. it is that, I've been, yeah. I went Warhammer World. I was it wasn't even on my radar really, and then we went for a for a staff event siege. Nuts, nuts place. Had you I ever, would, had would, you ever been before? Never been before. Yeah, okay. But like that, would you ever? You'd probably. I, I guarantee, because I was the same, not before then, but before I went, were you ever actually that bothered about going or were you like... Oh, not that bothered. And I didn't yeah. think as well. I didn't realize that the like museum exhibition thing was like multiple rooms, like oh. a couple of hours to get through. I was thinking it'd be like a little room with some like box art models in it. Huge dioramas. Yeah. Massive slash, stuff. You've got to do slash it. Jewels. Like, like, massive if, stuff. If you're watching this... Like channel, stuff you have to climb stairs to look at. Like. Yeah. yeah. And and it's... Majority of it is it's the box art models yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. the models that are on the box the box art models yeah, in like, a cabinet yeah. in yeah. front of your face yeah. like and I think I spoke about it before I don't know if I mentioned it on the podcast but there was that old tower ethereal that I was painting Yeah, and you can't find any pictures of it anywhere because mm. it never actually had box art in terms of like it didn't come in a box was it the army box special edition it was one? the army yeah, box yeah. special edition yeah. one it's a metal model yeah. um, and I could not for the life of me find a picture of the back of it. And I had no reference on how to paint the back of this model. And then I go to, I, I go given up pretty much um, on a separate point, went to Warhammer Wells. Um, they've got the box art model because obviously it, they had an every metal version of the model to have in magazines and stuff, but you only had the, the front image. Um, and it's on a display that has a mirror behind it. Brilliant. And I literally zoomed in on my phone on the mirror, <laughs> got a picture of the back of the model. Um, and unless anyone else has done that, I think I must have the only picture that exists of the back of that model. <laughs> um, and it really helped. So like, there's the, it's insane, the models that you can see going there. It's worth traveling, like, yeah. even if you're elsewhere in the UK and it's like multiple hours I'm to drive. Like, next week, I'm going up to Sheffield on the Saturday and I am planning an extra couple of hours just to stop off in Nottingham and just like go in there just because I've been in a little while, like just yeah. to get a bit it's, of it, like, it motivation. Is, it is really, really, really worth it. Like if you, even if you're not in the UK and you're coming over to the UK, uh, it, like England's not the biggest country in the world. You can pretty much get anywhere in England for within a day. Um, not within a day, within like six hours. Yeah. <laughs> so there's 24 hours in a day, George. It's, yeah. It's, well, it's, he's got you there. He's got you there. Technically within a day. <laughs> so uh, how much sleep do you want? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, like, uh, but no, you can you can pretty much get if you're in the UK, you can get there within within a day. And and I would strongly advise like if you're into this and you've never been like um, yeah to go because the, the the do you know the funniest thing obviously for me is. I've seen Warhammer World change massively over the years when I started. I went when I was very young and the I remember seeing like the Siege of the Emperor's Palace. That was a display. It was a fireplace so they converted into the into the gate with like a titan like Titans. Uh, that's all obviously not there anymore now. But but I've seen it gone from a really tiny little museum all the way through to this crazy thing that you that you experienced as the first time when you we done that siege Christmas too and we're all up there. Um so to see that progression of it, it, I was like you back then in the day when it was a fireplace and 300, 400 models, whatever it was. But to, to really how it is now is like the most incredible. I think there's 400 models in this first cabinet. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Do you know what I'll say as well? First time I went was 2017, I think. And been, you know, sporadically since then. The exhibition, First of all, you can go in there. You can go in the shops. You can use the game hall. You can go to Bugman's Bar, all free. Mm -hmm. You just walk in. Don't need to book anything. And then the exhibition, which is the only thing really you have to pay for, mm -hmm. other than all the models you're going to be buying when you're there, <laughs> is I think it, it's like seven pound or something. It's it like yeah. seven quid, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it. been seven quid since I've went the first time. So, so with it's inflation. Like, you're making money. Do you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> and if you find the assassin, then you're laughing. You find the assassin in Ticket that little, for, that little yeah. game thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's honestly... They also have a, yeah. It's turned into a bit of an advert for Warhammer World, but yeah, yeah it's, it's... They have Forge World there as well. You can see all the Forge World stuff. If this, if this conversation doesn't show you how much of a mo like motivational place for paint in Warhammer World is I don't know I only mentioned it and we've gone off on a whole conversation well, about how good it is Pretzel Meister if you can't make it to Warhammer World don't be disheartened please refer to uh, the first the few, other points the first first few few episodes, so even not, like there'd be other places 
local stores, whatever, that have models on show. Almost, sometimes just seeing other people's models. There's lots person. of model expos like all yeah. over the world as well, not yeah, just yeah. specific right, to Warhammer. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. I remember, have you ever been to like like a model train show or something? But like, they're nuts. No, How crazy. No. Yeah, but Were you eating like refreshers that? there? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was full of mostly old people to be fair. Yeah, I was going to say, say spectrum, model but... trains is like, it's more of a Werther's market. <laughs> <I think. laughs> <They're> the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, right, James, you've alluded to it. Hobby hacks. This yes. is our closing segment on the show where we share a hobby hack with you. If you have one, please leave it in the comments. James, far away. So this one is uh, is a, a, a freak discovery that um, saved my bacon on a, on a numerous occasions. Um, so so yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. It was the way you said it. It was the way you said it. Save my bacon isn't even that outlandish, but the way you said it just made me laugh. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's all right. Save so, my bacon. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, so with we're talking about spray cans, obviously using them at a decent distance and all of that. So when I was a lot younger, um, I used to spray can too far away and it was too cold. And you can imagine the 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 model was more texturized than the surface of the moon. It was literally like full of craters, divots, all those kind of things. And obviously back then once that you've done that, you can't really do much to the to the to the model. That's it. You know, I have to strip them and take that off and restart again. Um, so it always bugged me, and I was like, "How can I if I if I don't have a really bad finish, as in like maybe it's a little bit rougher, and that can happen if the can's sitting for a long time on a shelf and you don't shake it too much before you use it, it comes out way more powdery." Just well, if because- you read the instructions on the can, it does say to shake it for two to three minutes. Yes, and correct. if you're a real freak like me, you will sit there and start a stopwatch on your phone. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Olympic can can shaking times have never been sort of like a topic or thing that I want to do. But <laughs> but 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 with that being said, if the can has been sitting on a shelf for quite a considerable period of time, you don't shake it to enough, or for example, the temperature is, is not correct or whatever, or the distance from the object is not correct. Long story short, if you get some form of subtle texture from the spray can, then I have the tool for you. Um, I used to get. A, either a soft or firm, cheap 39p boots toothbrush that like you wouldn't put near your gums because it would rip into shreds. Not just yeah. any toothbrush, a toothbrush specifically from boots that yeah. specifically costs yeah, yeah. 39p. Hey, you, yeah. you can will go rip your gums to Poundland, shreds. Savers, Superdrug, wherever your, your, your retailer of choice. Your drugstore yeah, of choice. Drug yeah. store, well, not a drugstore, George. Yeah. Uh, That's but what like, you can get, a drugstore. It is a drugstore. Pharmacy, yeah. but yeah, okay. It's, but, <laughs> He's straight edge, he calls it a pharmacy. It's a pharmacy. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. but uh, you can go the to- The American viewers, drugstore. But you can go to any of those and uh, get yourself a really cheap toothbrush that you wouldn't like, you know, you know, if you go on holiday and you forget your toothbrush, you go to shops and you just find like the one you can just use because you need one really quickly. The one from like the hotel lobby. Yeah, the hotel lobby, yeah. Next to like some charm that, bracelets. That, that, is the, that is the toothbrush that you want to acquire. Um, and and uh, what you can do with it is you can lightly buff the model and, it, and if it's a soft toothbrush it won't scratch like cause like scratching on the model but what it will do is the is the is the movement of the brush any of those little particles that are like almost stuck to the paint but they're not properly secured it will just take them off and actually smooth the finish of the model where this goes up to 11 is when you buy an electric toothbrush oh my god yeah okay and then you do it with an electric toothbrush and it almost polishes the roughness off of that Badly primed or uh, I'm just imagining model. you there with like your car washing it with like a buffing wheel and you're like, hang on a minute, this is a light bulb moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a very, very big light bulb moment. It works. I love the idea of him using the toothbrush on the car. That just is funny. I mean, buffing, that, but, and he gets the buffing wheel for his model. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> the wall just explodes. Yeah. Um, no, but you can use uh, either a, a, a really cheap, uh, soft or firm toothbrush, whichever you prefer and whichever you want to use. But when you use an, uh, uh, an old electric toothbrush, because what happens is an old electric toothbrush runs out of battery or the battery doesn't last as long. So you can just literally use, keep your old one, don't throw it away or get rid of it. And then whenever you need to, you have that mistake or, or problem, you just get that out, stick it. You know stick what? You can change the head on the toothbrush. I was going to say, yeah, you yeah. can change the head well, on the toothbrush. you can do electric. that. Yeah, I'm use just saying. Use your main one. Use your main, your main one. You're getting dual use out. Use your then. Oral-B toothbrush that you got for Christmas. Just that get was a separate head. Quid. Don't confuse the heads though. Don't do one. <laughs> Yeah, red teeth. Yeah, yeah. Like, especially if you yeah. use like, well, if you're one of those people that uses like the charcoal toothpaste and it's like already black, yeah, you're like, yeah. you're looking at the two, <laughs> you're looking at the two heads and you're like, is it, is it Abaddon black or is it charcoal toothpaste? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, but no, it, do, it does work. And the thing is because, because um, it's, you're not going to be, for, 
physically scrubbing it with the, with the hand action yourself, obviously, if the electric toothbrush is doing it, then only really you've got to just move it without putting force on it. Um, and it does actually work. Go cool. on, uh, have you experimented with different compounds in this? Uh, this no. I'm, You're just going in raw with get, the toothbrush? Don't get that, that into it, George. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm imagining like, we're like, he's like, hmm, what if the toothpaste is slightly abrasive? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God, what if you've got charcoal toothpaste and <laughs> used it on the model? I bet that would work. Uh, uh, find out in future episodes. No. We're not, we're not, <laughs> I'm going to test that. No, no, no. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back next week. Yeah. Answers for but, that. but as a really good hobby hack, uh, electric toothbrush, if you do get a slightly, slightly rough finish on there. Get some it, turtle wax. It, 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 well, you don't have to put wax on there. <laughs> but like, it, it, you literally, you literally can buff the model and it does work and uh, yeah I, I've it's it's saved me a few times when I've used that so so yeah so I, I didn't like, think he was going when he said the toothbrush thing I didn't I didn't know where he was going to be honest but yeah fair, I thought fair I, I, the only thing I could logically think of was that he was going to like flick paint at the model or something Oh, well, well, you, like can, you can yeah, yeah. you can do that, I suppose. Yeah, but I prefer it's an extra use that your toothbrush. I'll tell you what, if you, maybe one. if you're doing like Angron or something, you use the electric toothbrush to do that. Oh, yeah, you just, just goes everywhere. Yeah, it just splats everywhere. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, right. Fine. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. If you could please do us a huge favor and subscribe to us on YouTube if you're watching the video version, or if you're on your audio platform of choice, follow us on Apple Podcasts or subscribe on Spotify. That'd really, really help us out, and we can keep bringing you these episodes for free every week. Thank you very much. We will see you soon. Mm-hmm.